Second part of chapter 5 of the first volume of the Life of Reason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Fredrik Karlsson. The Life of Reason by George Santayana. Side note. Ghostly character of mind. Mind is, therefore, sometimes identified with the unreal. We oppose in an antithesis natural to thought and language the imaginary to the true fancy to fact idea to thing but this thing fact or external reality is as we have seen a completion and hypostasis of certain portions of experience packed into such shapes as prove cogent in thought and practice the stuff of external reality the matter out of which its idea is made is therefore continuous with the stuff and matter of our minds their common substance is the immediate flux this living worm has propagated by fission and the two halves into which it has divided its life are mind and nature mind has kept and clarified the crude appearance the dream the purpose that seethed in the mass nature has appropriated the order the constant conditions the causal substructure disclosed in reflection by which the immediate flux is explained and controlled the chemistry of thought has precipitated these contrasted terms each maintaining a recognizable identity and having the function of a point of reference for memory and will some of these terms or objects of thought we call things and marshal in all their ideal stability for there is constancy in their motions and transformations to make the intelligible external world of practice and science whatever stuff has not been absorbed in this construction whatever facts of sensation ideation or will do not coalesce with the newest conception of reality we then call the mind raw experience then lies at the basis of the idea of nature and approves its reality while an equal reality belongs to the residue of experience not taken up as yet into that idea but this residual sensuous reality often seems comparatively unreal because what it presents is entirely without practical force apart from its mechanical associates this inconsequential character of what remains over follows of itself from the concretion of whatever is constant and efficacious in the external world if this fact is ever called in question it is only because the external world is vaguely conceived and loose wills and ideas are thought to govern it by magic yet in many ways falling short of absolute precision people recognize that thought is not dynamic or as they call it not real the idea of the physical world is the first flower or thick cream of practical thinking being skimmed off first and proving so nutritious it leaves the liquid below somewhat thin and unsavoury especially does this result appear when science is still unpruned and mythical so that what passes into the idea of material nature is much more than the truly causal network of forces and includes many spiritual and moral functions the material world as conceived in the first instance had not that clear abstractness nor the spiritual world that wealth and interest which they have acquired for modern minds the complex reactions of man's soul had been objectified together with those visual and tactile sensations which reduced to a mathematical boldness now furnish terms to natural science mind then dwelt in the world not only in the warmth and beauty with which it literally clothed material objects as it still does in poetic perception 
but in a literal animistic way, for human passion and reflection were attributed to every object and made a fairyland of the world. Poetry and religion discerned life in those very places in which sense and understanding perceived body, and when so much of the burden of experience took wing into space and the soul herself floated almost visibly among the forms of nature, it is no marvel that the poor remnant, a mass of merely personal troubles and uninteresting distortion of things in individual minds, should have seemed a sad and unsubstantial accident. The inner world was all the more ghostly because the outer world was so much alive. Side note hypostasis and criticism both need control this movement of thought which clothed external objects in all the wealth of undeciphered dreams has long lost its momentum and yielded to a contrary tendency just as the hypostasis of some terms in experience is sanctioned by reason when the objects so fixed and externalized can serve as causes and explanations for the order of events, so the criticism which tends to retract that hypostasis is sanctioned by reason when the hypostasis has exceeded its function and the external object conceived is loaded with useless ornament. The transcendental and functional secret of such hypostasis, however, is seldom appreciated by the headlong mind, so that the ebb no less than the flow of objectification goes on blindly and impulsively, and is carried to absurd extremes. An age of mythology yields to an age of subjectivity, reason being equally neglected and exceeded in both. The reaction against imagination has left the external world, as represented in many minds, stark and bare. All the interesting and vital qualities which matter had once been endowed with have been attributed instead to an irresponsible sensibility in man. And as habits of ideation change slowly and yield only piecemeal to criticism or to fresh intuitions, such a revolution has not been carried out consistently, but instead of thorough renaming of things and a new organization of thought, it has produced chiefly distress and confusion. Some phases of this confusion may perhaps repay a moment's attention. They may enable us, when seen in their logical sequence, to understand somewhat better the hypostasizing intellect that is trying to assert itself and come to the light through all these gropings. Side note. Comparative constancy in objects and in ideas. What helps in the first place to disclose a permanent object is a permanent sensation. There is a vast and clear difference between a floating and a fixed feeling. The latter, in normal circumstances, is present only when continuous stimulation renews it at every moment. Attention may wander, but the objects in the environment do not cease to radiate their influences on the body, which is thereby not allowed to lose the modification which those influences provoke. The consequent perception is therefore always at hand and in its repetition substantially identical. Perceptions not renewed in this way by continuous stimulation come and go with cerebral currents. They are rare visitors, instead of being, like external objects, members of the household. Intelligence is most at home in the ultimate, which is the object of intent those realities which it can trust and continually recover are its familiar and beloved companions the mists that may originally have divided it from them and which psychologists call the mind are gladly forgotten so soon as intelligence avails to pierce them and as friendly communication can be established with the real world moreover 
perceptions not sustained by a constant external stimulus are apt to be greatly changed when they reappear, and to be changed unaccountably, whereas external things show some method and proportion in their variations. Even when not much change in themselves, mere ideas fall into a new setting, whereas things, unless something else has intervened to move them, reappear in their old places. Finally things are acted upon by other men, but thoughts are hidden from them by divine miracle. Existence reveals reality when the flux discloses something permanent that dominates it. What is thus dominated, though it is the primary existence itself, is thereby degraded to appearance. Perceptions caused by external objects are, as we have just seen, long sustained in comparison with thoughts and fancies but the objects are themselves in flux, and a man's relation to them may be even more variable, so that very often a memory or a sentiment will recur, almost unchanged in character, long after the perception that first arose it has become impossible. The brain, though mobile, is subject to habit, its formations, while they lapse instantly, return again and again. These ideal objects may accordingly be in a way more real and enduring than things external. Hence no primitive mind puts all reality, or what is most real in reality, in an abstract material universe. It finds, rather, ideal points of reference by which material mutation itself seems to be controlled. An ideal world is recognized from the beginning and placed, not in the immediate foreground, nearer than material things, but much farther off. It has greater substantiality and independence than material objects are credited with. It is divine. When agriculture, commerce, or manual crafts have given men some knowledge of nature, the world thus recognized and dominated is far from seeming ultimate. It is thought to lie between two others, both now often called mental, but in their original quality altogether disparate, the world of spiritual forces and that of sensuous appearance. The notions of permanence and independence by which material objects are conceived apply also, of course, to everything spiritual. And while the dominion exercised by spirits may be somewhat precarious, they are as remote as possible from immediacy and sensation. They come and go. They govern nature, or, if they neglect to do so, it is from aversion or high indifference. They visit man with obsessions and diseases. They hasten to extricate him from difficulties, and they dwell in him, constituting his powers of conscience and inventions. Sense, on the other hand, is a mere effect, either of body or spirit, or of both in conjunction. It gives a vitiated personal view of these realities. Its pleasures are dangerous and unintelligent, and it perishes as it goes. Side note: Spirit and sense defined by their relation to nature. Such are, for primitive a perception, the three great realms of being, nature, sense, and spirit. Their frontiers, however, always remain uncertain. Sense, because it is insignificant when made an object, is long neglected by reflection. No attempt is made to describe its processes or ally them systematically to natural changes. Its illusions, when noticed, are regarded as scandals calculated to foster skepticism. The spiritual world is, on the other hand, a constant theme for poetry and speculation. 
in the absence of ideal science it can be conceived only in myths which are naturally as shifting and self-contradictory as they are persistent they acquire no fixed character until in dogmatic religion they are defined with reference to natural events foretold or reported nature is what first acquires a form and then imparts form to the other spheres sense admits definition and distribution only as an effect of nature and spirit only as its principle side note vague notions of nature involve vague notions of spirit the form nature acquires is however itself vague and uncertain and can ill serve for long ages to define the other realms which depend on it for definition hence it has been common for instance to treat the spiritual as a remote or finer form of the natural beyond the moon everything seemed permanent it was therefore called divine and declared to preside over the rest the breath that escaped from the lips at death since it took away with it the spiritual control and miraculous life that had quickened the flesh was itself the spirit on the other hand natural processes have been persistently attributed to spiritual causes for it was not matter that moved itself but intent that moved it thus spirit was barbarously taken for a natural substance and a natural force it was identified with everything in which it was manifested so long as no natural causes could be assigned for that operation side note sense and spirit the life of nature which science redistributes but does not deny if the unification of nature were complete sense would evidently fall within it it is to subtend and sustain the sensible flux that intelligence acknowledges first stray material objects and then their general system the elements of experience not taken up into the constitution of objects remain attached to them as their life in the end the dynamic skeleton without losing its articulation would be clothed again with its flesh suppose my notions of astronomy allowed me to believe that the sun sinking into the sea was extinguished every evening and that what appeared the next morning was his younger brother hatched in a sun-producing nest to be found in the eastern regions my theory would have robbed yesterday's sun of its life and brightness it would have asserted that during the night no sun existed anywhere but it would have added the sun's qualities afresh to a matter that did not previously possess them namely to the imagined egg that would produce a sun for tomorrow suppose we substitute for that astronomy the one that now prevails we have deprived the single sun which now exists and spreads its influences without interruption of its humanity and even of its metaphysical unity it has become a congeries of chemical substances the facts revealed to perception have partly changed their locus and been differently deployed throughout nature some have become attached to operations in a human brain nature has not thereby lost any quality she had ever manifested these have merely been redistributed so as to secure a more systematic connection between them all they are the materials of the system which has been conceived by making existences continuous whenever this extension of their being was needful to render their recurrences intelligible sense which was formerly regarded as a sad distortion of its objects now become an original and congruent part of nature from which as from any other part the rest of nature might be scientifically inferred spirit is not less closely attached to nature although in a different manner taken existentially 
it is a part of sense. Taken ideally, it is the form or value which nature acquires when viewed from the vantage ground of any interest. Individual objects are recognizable for a time not because the flux is materially arrested, but because it somewhere circulates in a fashion which awakens an interest and brings different parts of the surrounding process into definable and prolonged relations with that interest. Particular objects may perish, yet others may continue, like the series of suns imagined by Heraclitus, to perform the same office. The function will outlast the particular organ. That interest in reference to which the function is defined will essentially determine a perfect world of responsive extensions and conditions. These ideals will be a spiritual reality, and they will be expressed in nature in so far as nature supports that regulative interest. Many a perfect and eternal realm, merely potential in existence but definite in constitution, will thus subtend nature and be what a rational philosophy might call the ideal. What is called spirit would be the ideal in so far as it obtained expression in nature, and the power attributed to spirit would be the part of nature's fertility by which such expression was secured. End of chapter 5